Well, hello. I want to uh, get, we'll get started just a minute or so early since uh, things are filled up. We want to give Dr. Darub as much time as we can. I want to welcome you here to the uh, Livermore Library at the university. My name is Dennis Swanson. I'm the dean of the library, and we want to uh, welcome you to this uh, event and uh, um, greet everyone uh, that, that's come from the community, our students, faculty, other folks, uh, welcome. Wanted to highlight just a couple of things as people are still coming in. Uh, we have regular events here in the library. We do different things, uh, not only for our students, but also for uh, the community. And our friends of the library program, um, our president, some of our officers are here. They're, they'll have some literature for you if, if you're interested. But uh, a couple of other events coming up to make you aware of. On Saturday, September the 9th uh, at noon, we're going to have a lunch and lecture here in the library reading room. It's going to be our fall library fundraiser. And Dr. Richard Vella from our English department is going to be speaking on his research about Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Um, lunch is going to be prepared and uh, provided. Uh, tickets are $30 a piece, but, uh, and, and, and advance reservations would be nice so we can plan for that. But if you're interested, there's also, uh, that's earlier in the day before the um, uh, production of Romeo and Juliet at GPAC, which is going to be on September the 14th. Uh, you can call, contact um, Janet Gentis over in the um, Department of Arts and Science for more information. On Thursday, October the 19th at 3 in the afternoon, this is somewhat self-serving, but there's going to be a book discussion um, that I'm going to lead on, on the book by Alan Alda entitled, If I Understood You, Would I Have This Look on My Face? My Adventures in the Art and Science of Relating and Communicating. And so uh, we'll invite you to that. We'll have uh, um, that coming up. We also have several uh, faculty showcases scheduled for the year with uh, faculty members presenting on their uh, books or uh, other publications they've done. So we have those coming up as well. But we want to thank you. We want to get going with the event itself. It, it, eclipses are fascinating in that they're so rare. They, they, they occur all over the world, but they occur very rarely uh, in the North American hemisphere. Uh, one of them, July of 1778, George Rogers Clark was leading an expedition in the Revolutionary War to um, take Ohio or that area. And on the day he had his 120 men gathered up on the boat ready to go up the uh, Ohio River, there was an eclipse, which of course was normally a terrifying event. And uh, George Rogers Clark convinced his men that it was a good omen. Um, in earlier times, in 585 BC, uh, Thales of Miletus had predicted, who was the, the kind of the father of geometry and many other sciences, he had predicted a, an eclipse would occur. And there was a battle that began to occur after his prediction. And the armies on both sides were so terrified by the event that they laid down their arms and they declared peace, which would be a nice uh, result of any eclipse, I think. And, and, and so they're very, very uh, stimulating, both uh, uh, emotionally and, and intellectually. But today we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Jose Deruda from our own faculty. Dr. Deruda has uh, been teaching here since 1974. He's professor of, of physics. He opened the uh, UNCP observatory. In 2007, he was the Board of Governors uh, recipient of the Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award and, and has, uh, in my year here at the, at the university, has uh, proven to be a great friend, not only of the library, but of, uh, of myself and other uh, people new here, kind of getting their, their feet wet in what's going on, and, and a great leader here on the campus. So without taking up any more time and giving him as much opportunity as possible, and I'm going to let him explain the glasses, uh, um, I want to welcome Dr. Deruda. Thank you.
Thank you. Can you all hear me up there? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, what I want to do here is not only talk about eclipses, but I want to give you a little background of the universe today. And so we'll start our presentation off looking at the size of things, and from that point we'll go on to talking about black holes and then into eclipses. Um, if you can all hear me without the microphone, can you hear me? Yes or no? Thank you. How big is big? Let's take a look at the Earth's side and compare it to other planets. Well, you see, basically, the Earth is pretty big among these planets we see. However, if you compare the Earth to, let's say, Jupiter um, and Uranus, uh, the Earth is kind of a small guy right here. And so, it's all a matter of perspective. And if we compare Jupiter to the sun, our own sun, you see our sun is kind of very big. Do you all agree with that, yes or no? Yeah. It's big, big, right? And it is big. It controls the solar system. But when you compare the sun to other stars, look at the sun here compared to Arctus. Imagine that. I mean, our sun is big, but look compared to Arctus. And if you compare it also to Antis, look at how big those stars are. So universe, basically, the basic element of the universe is stars. Planets come in later on. But stars are the main things. And the grouping of stars is what gives you galaxies. And galaxies are like islands in an ocean. And in between one island and another island, there's water. In space, there's space. And right now, we know there are over 125 billion galaxies. And each galaxy has over a billion stars. And if each star has eight or nine planets, look at the possibility of life somewhere else in the universe. And the good news is, the laws of physics applies everywhere. So that's what we count on. So let's go ahead and look at some further slides here. Galileo was really the first to go ahead and look at the different planets uh, using a telescope. And the telescope he used was only a 10 power telescope. Your binoculars could see what Galileo saw. So you have an opportunity on your own when Jupiter is out there to take your binoculars and look at it and you could see the moons going around Jupiter because Galileo saw them, and it got him in trouble, of course. And of course, if you look at Saturn, Saturn's a big, beautiful planet with rings on it, but it's not the only planet with rings. There are three or four other planets with rings. Rings occur when moons get too close to a planet and they break up, and after millions of years, they form what we call rings. So here's Jupiter, a picture of Jupiter with its four moons. This got Galileo in trouble. He had to go and go to prison. His prison was his, his house, but he was confined to live in his house, and his daughter came and took care of him. There's a wonderful book called Galileo's Daughter. Well, while he was confined in his house, he didn't just sit there and watch TV, right? He actually did experiments. And the experiments he did brought forth the groundwork that Newton would use on his first law of inertia. Well, for centuries, we have imagined how the planets move and how the stars move. And we've only been aided with computer animation or the efforts of Hollywood. Well, tonight that's gonna change because Juno, on its approach, managed to capture a movie of Jupiter and its moons. 
and we're going to show that to you tonight. And for the first time, all of us together will actually see the true harmony in nature. This is what it's about. This is what Jupiter and its moons look like. This is what our solar system looks like if you were to move out. It's what the galaxy looks like. They're not bright It's what the so. atoms look like. But anyway, it's the harmony of the at every scale. moons of Jupiter going around Jupiter. Well, uh, telescopes were then basically a basic tool for looking at the universe. And one of the biggest telescopes at the time, 1921, was the Yerke telescope. This is a big refractor telescope. We don't really make refractor telescopes anymore. We make reflector telescopes. But basically, this was our only tool of looking at the universe. And if you see this, and you get a heart attack, but maybe not, OK? Um, Basically, the big change in astronomy came with photography. Photography did it for us. Before the camera, when we looked at the universe, we couldn't capture the image but in our brain. But if we had photography, we could put a camera at the back of the telescope and leave the camera exposed for several hours, and we saw a whole new universe, where we saw only 10, 15 stars before, we now see thousands of them. So astronomy and telescopes um, and uh, uh, photography are the big moves that we did. Some of the people who really were big in this was Ann Cannon. Ann Cannon was among 12 different women who worked at Harvard. And they didn't get paid for what they were doing. But they basically would take pictures. Uh, uh, of the universe, and they would sit in sunlight because they didn't have light bulbs, probably, and they would identify the different stars. And what they identified, basically, were stars that you could not have seen before. This is the CCD camera. You all have these cameras on your cell phone. You have them at home. The big thing in these cameras is that chip. That's the CCD chip. The first chips that were created were for astronomy before cameras. It came from astronomy and physics. And those chips in the beginning were $10,000 a piece. Now you have a $100 camera at home that's no good. Take it apart. There's a CCD chip in there. Maybe you can experiment and find out how to connect it to a telescope. So the CCD chips were really the motion forward. And with this kind of optics, we notice that stars have colors. They really have colors. You can't see it with your eyes because your eyes only see it and it reports to your brain. But a camera would record the color. And the news is, from astronomy, is the color will tell us, basically, the size of the star. OK? And it tells us, basically, how far away it is. So using CCD astronomy, we can determine, basically, the size of our own universe. Um, it all changed back in October 4th, 1957. The beginning of the space program. This was the Sputnik that was launched. And anyone here my age probably remembers going up an old radio in the attic and listening for Sputnik. Because in those days, the radios had different bands, not AM and FM only. And of course, the Russians were the first to launch the satellite into space. And satellites were about the size of a football. And basically, you would sit around your radio and try to listen to it. Well, a guy named Kennedy from Massachusetts, where I'm from, actually 50 miles from where I'm from, um, had an idea and got elected to be president. Yep, I'm sorry. Can't get that one up. I'll try it one more time.
I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We'll That's to important organize thing. and measure the best of our energies and skills. 60 seconds. Lights on. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Down, four down forward. That four forward, drift into the right a little. 30. 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Forward. Contact light. Raise your hand if you remember that. Raise your hand. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Okay, so next we develop a telescope to put in orbit called the Hubble Telescope. The very powerful telescope was launched up from Cape Kennedy, um, and basically I had taken 25 students down there to watch the launch. Four seconds before liftoff, they scrubbed it. So 10 days later, they launched it, okay? But I have taken other students down to watch four other launches. But anyways, this is what Hubble does. It basically orbits the Earth, and it has a, a uh, eyelashes, if you like, or eyelids, and it can open and close those eyelids to protect it from harmful rays from the sun. And it goes around the Earth in orbit, several 17, 18,000 miles an hour around the Earth. And while it's doing that, it's looking at a galaxy hundreds of light years away as it moves around the Earth, focusing on that galaxy for four or five hours in order to get a picture. Remarkable technology. And so the light comes in and basically uh, gets recorded. Uh, here it is looking at a galaxy very far away. Uh, it then sends the information to a satellite, satellite down to Earth, and the Earth gives it the pictures. I don't know if you know this, but the first communication from the men landing on the moon came through North Carolina. The, the connection was from the moon to Perry, North Carolina, which is the northwest part of the state, where there's gonna also be an eclipse party on the 21st. Um, so is what, is what Hubble sees. It takes a small area, a very tiny area, and blows it up. And then it blows that up further. Okay, and in that tiny era, area, it sees all these objects. Those are not stars, those are galaxies. Each galaxy having billions of stars. And like I mentioned, each star could have eight or nine planets of their own. So the universe is huge. Um, and this is called the Hubble Deep Field. That was one of the first shots that the Hubble took. This is the next generation Hubble. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope, due to be launched 2018. And look at the difference in size between Hubble and the new telescope. We should be getting fantastic pictures coming. And this is a model of it and the people who are working on it. And this is what it would look like in space. Well, there's a guy named Einstein who basically took physics and turned it upside down. And one of his conclusions were that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. It's not only a theory, it's the law. So you gotta obey the law. Now people tr keep trying to show them wrong, and that's good, in physics you want to be keep checking if somebody's right, hasn't been done yet. The beauty about this is that if you look at our Milky Way, this is a model. And if this is our sun in the Milky Way, and we're looking at stars over here, about 3,000 light years from the Earth, and if all of a sudden we get a message from there, that occurred 3,000 years ago. And not only that, when you look at the sun, 
the light you're getting left there seven or eight minutes ago. So if the sun blew up right now, you wouldn't know about it until you saw the explosion. And that would take seven or eight minutes. The universe is hampered, if you like, by the speed of light. On the other hand, it's an advantage. The advantage is that if we look at a nearby galaxy, this is Andronima, our nearest neighbor. It's two million light years from the Earth. So by looking at Andronima and studying the light, we're looking back into time. We're looking two million years back into time because it took two million years for the light to get here. And then when we see galaxies that are eight or nine billion light years from the Earth, by studying the light that we get from it on the Earth, we're looking back into time seven or eight billion years ago. So it's given us a way of figuring out where this all came from. It's remarkable. The entire universe is remarkable. You know, you're very, very lucky to be on a planet that has life. Right now, it's the only planet with life. You are it. And if anything happens to you, the universe will have lost life. Keep that in mind. OK, so um, you know, we keep checking things to make sure that we are correct in our theories. And one of the questions you like to ask is, what is a lot? There's a lot of people in here right now. And I have 200 pairs of eclipse eyeglasses. I think we'll make it, <laughs> OK? But it's going to be close, OK? Um, so basically, this is one of Carl Sagan's cartoons. Um, look at all those stars, OK? Carl Sagan says there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, and there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, and each galaxy is contained 100 billion stars. Sort of put things in perspective. Well, let me give you a picture of one little small area of our sky, of stars in our own galaxy, right here. Those are all stars in your galaxy. They're all suns. A star is the sun. And here's another picture. And here's another thing. Counting them. You sit there with a little pencil and paper and begin counting them. We count them, of course, like if you were a medical technologist counting blood cells in a hospital. You look at an area, you count them, you use statistics. So these are all other stars in our own galaxy. Now, is there an evolution of stars? Well, one year in my 52 years of teaching here, I had a butterfly in my class. And it was an intelligent butterfly. And that butterfly came up to me after class. And he says, you know, Doc, I only have one day to live. How can I figure out the evolution of the human being? I said, well, go around and look around and come back before you die. So he flew out the window. And at the end of the day, he flew back in. He says, Doc, I figured it out. He said, I saw little babies being born. I saw kids who were teenagers dragging up and down. I saw kids in college. I saw older pe people getting married. I saw older people. So he could not follow one human being throughout that person's life. But he could do statistics. And he did statistics. That's what we do in astronomy. We find stars that are being born. This is the Orion Nebulae new area where stars are being born. Another area, the Seven Sisters, Pleiades, those are new stars being born. We find stars that are dying, blowing up. Okay. And we find, basically, they're, they're stars of all natures. Here is a star that blew up in 1987. The light from that star, which is right here, when it blew up, was brighter than all the other stars in that galaxy. It's not our galaxy. So all these different, all these different, here's another one, sorry. Here's a, go back one more. Okay, I need to be patient. 
that's a crab nebulae. Okay, at the center of that nebulae is a star which had died, spinning around very fast and emitting radio waves, and we're picking them up on the Earth, and that's what you just heard. When we first heard them, we called it LG1, because the sound was so precise, we thought it was a little green man. So this was LG1, LGM1, then LGM2, and it turns out we found so many LGMs we knew it couldn't be life. So now we know a star, when it explodes, the remaining part of it compresses in because of angular momentum, spins very fast, magnetic field, if it's in the plane of the Earth, gives us that sound, sound of a pulsar. There's your Milky Way galaxy. I'd like to show a little model I have of it. This is the Milky Way galaxy. It's a nice little model. And basically, if you notice, there's a lot of red stars in the center. Well, red stars are older stars, okay? Stars which we call red giants. And there are stars all around the edges. And this makes up the Milky Way galaxy. You're located right here at that intersection, okay? You're about 25 light years from the edge of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy, we believe, are black holes, a lot of black holes. We believe the black holes control the galaxies. So we'll have billions of galaxies, we'll have billions of black holes, no problem with that. Um, and from one finger to the other finger, that's 100,000 light years. 100,000 light years. In other words, a star over here would take about 75,000 years for me to pick it up if it was sending me a radio message saying hello. Of course, I say hello back. That would take how long? Well, you got the story? It's because of Einstein, good old Einstein. Okay, so that's your Milky Way galaxy. That's your home. That's your home. That's where you live. You're part of uh, millions and billions of other stars. And this is a picture of other galaxies. Galaxies collide. These are two galaxies colliding. Remember I said we got hundreds of billions of galaxies. And the gravitational force from each of them attracts them, and they collide. Andronema, our nearest galaxy I showed you earlier, is two million light years from us. And we're on a collision course with it. We're going to collide, sorry. Don't worry about it. The sun won't be around then when they collide, okay? But the forces of gravity certainly play a big part in the role of the universe. Okay, so what's the Big Bang? You've heard of the Big Bang. Is that the Big Bang? <laughs> well, I mean, in a way we sort of like it in physics because it gets people used to the word Big Bang, okay? So it's a nice thing, in a way. Um, this is not the Big Bang either, where somebody's going to get their ears blocked off, okay, from his fellow scientists. So the big question, where did it all come from? And we, still, we asked that question millions of years ago, and we're still asking the same question. Well, I'm going to tell you where it all came from. Here's where it came from, right here the Big Bang. Right here, the Big Bang took place. And over time, the energy, every particle you see, before the Big Bang, there was no mass of any kind. There was just energy. Googles and Googles and Googles of energy. And somehow that energy was converted to mass. How can that be? You heard of Einstein? E is equal to mc squared. The E stands for energy. What does the M stand for? Mass. So in the Big Bang, energy converted mass. Unfortunately, in nuclear bombs, mass converts into energy. But that one equation says it all. E is equal to mc squared. So over time, the stars expanded. Uh, the mass expanded, formed atoms, 
Those atoms formed stars. Those stars, because of gravity, grouped together and created galaxies. Right now, we think the period is somewhere like 14 to 15 billion years ago. Now, does this occur in other places of the universe? I mean, is planets like the Earth being created there too? No reason why it shouldn't be. Okay, so well, where were you? I was out for 10 minutes. We realized how long the universe expanded when you come to my class late. By 10 minutes, that's what happens. <laughs> um, so here's a picture of it all. So let me see if I can explain this quickly. This is the Earth. The Earth is part of the solar system, the planets. The solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is part of the local group of galaxies, which includes the Milky Way, Andromeda, and a couple of other galaxies. That is part of the local supergroup, and the local supergroup is part of the entire universe. So you think you're pretty important in the scale of things? We're pretty small, imaginably small, okay? But we're the only life in the universe. This is it, okay? So what's a black hole? Well, uh, it's black, it's, it looks black, it's a hole, we'll call it a black hole. Not really the way it came about, okay? But basically, um, in order to understand a black hole, you gotta understand the difference between what Newton says and what Einstein says about gravity. Newton in 1700s, was trying to figure out how the moon went around the Earth. And everybody was saying, gee, what's holding the moon up? That was the question. But Newton realized there was nothing holding the moon up. The moon's falling. It's falling on your head right now. But because it's moving, it's missing us. You remember Darth Vader? He built this big machine to wipe out the people there. He didn't have to do that. All he had to do was slow down its moons, and the moons would crash into the planet. You slow down our moon, it crashes into the Earth. So Newton's idea was you have an object here and an object here. They both have mass, and they exert a force on one from the other. I don't know about you, but every time at night when I go to bed, I look out my window. I'm looking for that rope that's attached to the moon. I mean, what's making the moon go around? I know if I take a ball and put a string, I can make it go around. I don't see that ball, that rope, okay? Well, Newton was asked that question. He couldn't answer it. And he said, I do not deal in metaphysical speculation. In other words, let's skip that question for now and it still hasn't been answered, except by Einstein. Einstein's idea of gravity is totally different. Einstein says that the mass interacts with space. Now you think space is nothing, but space has properties. So when you put a heavy mass in space, it bends the space. And a light beam that's moving in space if it goes around a bent space, the light beam will bend. In other words, the light beam is our measure of space. If light goes straight, space is flat. If light curves, space is curved. So, Einstein had the idea that his theory could be proven by a solar eclipse, the 1919 solar eclipse. So he dispatched a couple of his colleagues, and they went, observed the solar eclipse, and what they saw was exactly what was predicted by Einstein and was amazing. Basically, they saw that when the light goes around a heavy object, the light bends, 
And during the solar eclipse that occurred, the star was over here. Now, it's always there. And the sun is there. But you can't see the stars because the sun is there. So if you could block out the light from the sun, you would see the star. So they observed that star. The light came around the sun, bent, went to their cameras, and the camera only goes in a straight line, and the camera says, ha ha, there's where the star is. But it's not really there, it's here. And the next day, the star was back where it's supposed to be. You understand that? So why study solar eclipse? This is just one reason why, okay? It proves that Einstein's theory of mass bending space has some merit. So nowadays, instead of saying what people say, in other words, you think Newton was sitting there and all of a sudden the apple fell and he says, ah, oh, gravity? Now look, we're talking the 1700s. I mean, people were shooting arrows, and they knew arrows went up and came down. They would walk off a cliff and they would be killed. They knew, you know. So that wasn't the thing that inspired Newton. What inspired him was when that apple fell, he realized everybody was asking the wrong question. Gravity is acting not only on apples, but Newton extended the force of gravity out to space. In other words, they didn't think gravity was acting on the moon, okay? But Newton extended it into space, and that's what he did with gravity. Of course, Einstein would come along and say, is a very massive, massive planet, and, and space is distorted. And so that distortion of space, here's a planet, a star, distorting space. And uh, here's another one right here. So here's light coming from a star, passes by the sun, gets spent. The eye of the person tracks it back to here. And the next day, when the sun and the night comes, you find out that star is not here, but right there. And that measure that uh, they did verified Einstein's theory of relativity. And a black hole is the same idea, but the mass is so massive, it creates a, a cut, a singularity. It rips it, and that's what a black hole is. And any light that enters a black hole can't come out, and any person who enters a black hole, forget about it, okay? Why? Well, we'll see in a minute. Okay, so here's another example of a gravitational, and this could be, for instance, um, the sun located right here, and this is the Earth going around this space. Now, you can't see that space. This is four-dimension space. We live in a three-dimension world. And this is what happens if you get sucked into a black hole. The force on your feet will be 10 tons. The force on your head will be one ton. You'll be stretched into spaghetti. It's called spaghettiation, okay? So um, no way of coming out. Um, a black hole uh, is one thing. A green hole is another thing. Something you see on a golf course, right? And there's a case where the green hole repels rather than sucks in. Okay. But anyhow, so what are eclipses? So this is what we're here for, right? So let me tell you that any chance you have to see it total, try to see it total, it will be a big difference. I'll give you the numbers in a minute. But I'm taking some students down to Santine, South Carolina. And um, I called the park up, and they said there's going to be a lot of people. You'll have to wait in line. They weren't very friendly. So I brought up Google, and I blew the map up. And guess what? Right over the bridge, there's a rest area, 18-wheel truck rest area, about 20 slots. So I don't believe they'll be there. They're usually sleeping at night. They may pull in when the sun 
goes away thinking it's night, okay? But uh, we're taking him down to uh, Santee. Um, so we've got about 20, 25 students from Robinson Community College and Pembroke who are going down. Um, so eclipse is when one object gets in front of another object. And I passed out pennies earlier. Um, I know people came in late. Do you all have a penny in your pocket, those that came in late? Okay, we're gonna basically do a ellipse right now. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna be the sun. I'm big enough to be the sun, right? And the moon is gonna be the penny. And anybody who doesn't have any, we can pass, we can pass, pass these around. Now, this is my wife here. And I asked her to marry me on August the 21st, 1965, because I knew there would be a solar eclipse, okay? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> What you're gonna do is you're gonna hold that hand. Can you use a quarter? Side, yeah. solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. A lunar eclipse you can see very often. Uh, it's covered, the light from the sun, the earth covers it from the moon. So you've seen those many times. They're not as rare as a solar eclipse. Now people may wonder why we don't have um, an eclipse every month. Where's my car? There it is. And this is why. Okay, if this is if this is the Earth's plane, if the Earth's in the center here, and the sun is over there, every time the moon gets in front of the Earth, you should see an ellipse. But you, that means every month. But you don't, the reason why the plane of the orbit of the moon is not the same as the plane of the orbit of the sun. It's tilted. So in other words, if the plane of the moon is right here, only when at certain times uh, it will block the light from the sun. So the reason we don't see a total solar eclipse every year, every month, is because they're not in the same plane about five degrees off. Okay, so um, is a, a lunar academy, a lunar e eclipse. The moon's over here, the earth blocks the light. That's not what we're gonna look at. And that's what the moon would look like. Uh, this is a solar eclipse where the moon gets in front of the, of the light from the sun. That's your penny, that's where your penny was. And your eyeball was right there, okay? Imagine that you were standing outside in the middle of the day 
and all of a sudden it got dark. The stars came out, the temperature dropped, and night animals started to call. A few minutes later, the sun came out again and everything was back to normal. What happened? You just saw a solar eclipse. Ancient cultures were often frightened by eclipses. They did not understand why the sun became dark. Eclipses were seen as bad omens or predictions of bad luck or disaster. But today we know that eclipses are caused by the normal movement of the sun and the moon. There are actually three types of solar eclipses. First, there is the most widely known type of eclipse, a total solar eclipse. A total solar eclipse occurs when the sun, moon, and earth align in the perfect position, causing the shadow of the moon to fall on a small area of the earth's surface. For people within the umbra, or darkest part of the moon's shadow, the light of the sun appears to vanish completely and the sky becomes as dark as night. The second type of solar eclipse is a partial eclipse. A partial eclipse occurs when the sun, moon, and earth are not perfectly aligned so that the penumbra, or lighter outer portion of the moon's shadow, falls on the earth. In a partial eclipse, part of the sun's surface appears to have a shadow on it. The third type of solar eclipse is an annular eclipse. During an annular eclipse, the moon is at its farthest distance from Earth, making the shadow that falls on the Earth's surface smaller than usual. Because the moon appears smaller, the shadow cannot block all of the sun, and the eclipse will appear like a dark disk in front of the sun. Solar eclipses can only occur during a new moon, as it is the only phase in the lunar cycle when the moon is aligned correctly between the Earth and the sun. Eclipses do not happen every time there is a new moon, however, because the moon's orbit is tilted compared to the Earth's. I just talked about sometimes in not the same night. plane. Solar eclipses are actually fairly regular astronomical events. Between two and five solar eclipses occur each year, but total solar eclipses only happen about every year and a half. Because the diamond the ring of which a total eclipse can be seen is so small, however, the chances of an individual eclipse being visible from where you are is very small. A total solar eclipse in your area might be a once-in-a-lifetime event. Once in a lifetime. Free. It is important to remember that looking directly at the sun can effect. hurt your eyes or even cause blindness. So you should avoid looking at the sun during an eclipse unless you have special eye protection or filters to block out the harmful light. If you don't have these filters, you can still observe the eclipse by making a pinhole camera using materials from around your home. Find out when the next solar eclipse will be visible from your area so that you can prepare to observe this exciting astronomical event. Okay, so the geometry is pretty straightforward. Sun, moon, earth in line, okay? And that gives you a pinpoint shadow. Um, very clear, uh, and that pinpoint shadow traces itself across the Earth. Um, and so it's partial, like they will be in Pembroke, but it'll be much better than this. Um, so this is an example of a partial solar eclipse. Um, this is a annual, this is when the moon is so far out that it doesn't really, you can't cover it. And so, these are time-lapse pictures of a total solar eclipse. Um, and uh, here you've got the diamond ring effect that you see at totality. Now, if you're in a path of totality, which is not Pembroke, at this point, you can take your glasses off and look at it with your eyes. You only have two minutes. In Pembroke, you can't do it. You've got to be in the path of totality. Okay, okay, so uh, we get more same types of time exposures um, and some animations. Watch the shadow on the earth right there, animation. Another animation, this is actually a, 
a picture taken from a satellite um, as the, uh, as, uh, for, from the space station as the lunar eclipse was occurring. Another one taken, you see the shadow of our cross. Uh, even moon, even Jupiter has solar eclipses. Hell, they got about 50 some moons. There's a bunch of them. You want to go to Jupiter? Okay, you can see a lot of them, okay? And there's Jupiter. And there are stars so far away, we don't know if they have life or if they have moons. But when the moon of that star goes in front of the star, the light that we measure from the Earth goes down. So that's one of the reasons eclipses help us determine if other stars have planets. More time exposure. Okay, so 1901 to 1950, uh, 1918, solar eclipse. Um, 1925, solar eclipse. It's across the United States, North America. Uh, 1951 to 2000, some of you have been alive during this period. Um, you notice there was one right here, and that was March 7th, 1970. And this is basically, Pembroke was in totality. March 7th, 1970. You had your chance. Did you take it? Raise your hand if you took it. Great. Okay. Um, and this is from the News and Observer, okay, of the solar eclipse. Um, I'll be taking some pictures, but I don't know if I'll make the News and Observer. Uh, okay, this is one that occurred in 79. Um, and this is ours right here. Now notice how wide it is compared to the other ones. You know why it's wide? Because the angle of the shadow. If the Earth was flat, it'd be just one thin line. But because the Earth is round, the shadow is hitting us, as you'll see in this animation. Watch the shadow. See how the shadow change? Actually, it might look better right here. Watch the shadow. The shadow knows. <laughs> That's an age-related joke. Okay, Pembroke, maximum, 245. You still need your glasses, don't take them off. Um, starts at 116. Two hours, 0.97% of the light's coming through. Now, there's Santine. See Santine? Lake Marion? That's where I'll be, okay? And this is basically where I'll be at the truck stop, right there, okay? And there's a blow up of the truck stop, okay? I mean, look at all the observation space. And there's also a restroom. And there's scope machines and other kinds of machines. So you can make yourself at home. Okay? So that's where I'll be. The next one, 2024. Okay, that's 2024. These are different ones. This is over the 21st century. There's the sun. Don't look at the sun through a telescope. Right? Don't look at the sun through a telescope. That's what happened to him. Okay? It takes people a while to see him, please God. Okay. Make a pinhole camera. Take two pieces of cardboard. Two pieces of cardboard. Put a hole in one, and then look at this other one. This will be the screen. Okay? That's a pinhole camera. We also have a sun spotter, and then we all have a Santee, and this basically is the sun spotter. Okay, picture of the screen as well. Gravity. <laughs> it still works. <laughs> the 
I did that on purpose. I always check gravity, okay? Uh, I'm a scientist. Now you can make a hole in the box and put your head in. That doesn't seem too comfortable to me, but you could do it. There's your screen. There's your sun spotter. That's what I have. There's glasses will be given out. And this is the difference in using glasses. That's with glasses, that's without glasses. And don't forget your four-legged friends, right? Live long and prosper. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another speaker. Where did the other speaker go? I'm right here. Okay. Um, anybody have any? We got uh, five minutes for questions. I'll also be around after for a small fee. How do you go with Uh 2002 Dodge Ram pickup, 1500. Yeah, you'll see me in the pocket. 2012. <laughs> Any questions? La okay, there's a microphone that was supposed to go around, but I guess my student went to class. Can you shout? Yeah. How does life behave passing through a prism going that somewhere like this? Um, light to a prism refracts, breaks up into the different wavelengths. That won't be a problem here because the light is being blocked. The shadow knows. Any other questions? Behind you. Where does this rank in all the astronomical events in your lifetime? Well, you know, I've never seen a total before. So it's going to be a big thing. We've seen a lot of partial when we are at Delaware, but the first time I'll see a total. Okay, now, question. Yeah. No, no, I got married the 21st. Right, but I picked that date. <laughs> Good day. Question. If you're filming it at totality, you don't need anything. Well, I mean, you got to worry about the optics of your, your camera. So I, I would have some kind of filter. I'll have my telescope there with a filter on it. Any other questions? Okay, um, the, um, the, the, the owner of the glasses has something to say. <laughs> the, um, all of you came, how many came for glasses? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we will have them, um, I believe we have them to hand out at the back door or in the area. Yes, we also know. have, um, um, some refreshments in the back. I think we've set out some cookies, some lemonade, and things like that. But we have, uh, uh, we'll be getting the glasses to you one way or another here. Uh, Don't kidnap my wife as she walks by with the glasses. You she understand? has the glasses. We also have some uh, additional. No one's going to uh, go without getting glasses. Thanks again to Dr. Deruta. And thank you all for making this a great and reasonably challenging event to stage.